cigarette butts actually pollute enough water every year to fill the Irish Sea. If you buy one pair of sunglasses made from our plastic, you actually save enough water from nicotine and microplastic pollution to fill a swimming pool. The world is headed down a very dark path. Unless we make some serious changes now, we want to be able to at least do our part and, and fix this massive issue as fast as we can, you know, before it's too late. I'm Vincent McCarthy and you're listening to the ESG Factor podcast. Today I'm talking to the co-founders of a sustainability startup in Dublin. They recycle cigarette butts and create a form of recycled plastic. I'm talking to Liam and Harry. Guys, nice to have you on the podcast. Liam, can you give us a snapshot of what your company does and how it came about? Yep, Vincent, thank you very much for having us. So most people don't know, but cigarette butts are actually the most common item of litter on the planet and one of the most toxic forms of ocean plastic. So six trillion cigarette butts are thrown away each year, and about two thirds of those end up as litter. Uh, when it, if you flick a cigarette butt on the street and then it rains, that butt will get carried into storm drains and from there into rivers and from there out to sea. Uh, so cigarette butts actually pollute enough water every year to fill the Irish Sea. Uh, so just one cigarette butt will pollute about a thousand liters of water by leaching out nicotine and breaking down into microplastic. They also contain heavy metals and at least 69 different chemicals that are known to cause cancer in humans. Um, and basically our solution to this ecological catastrophe is to collect and recycle cigarette butts into a plastic raw material that can be used to manufacture sustainable products. I think most people will be familiar with cigarettes as a form of uh, a negative impact on, on health, but actually an environmental impact is, is the big issue that you're tackling here. Yeah, so the environmental impact is enormous, and it's also the sort of environmental impact that comes back around to being a human health impact. So most urban drinking water now actually contains trace amounts of nicotine, because if you have anyone littering cigarette butts upstream from the reservoir where you get your drinking water, that nicotine ends up in the groundwater, and from there it ends up back into the water supply. Um, but the larger problem is the, the plastic. I mean, we find sea turtles with cigarette butts in their stomachs and birds trying to feed cigarette butts to their chicks. And you see these really awful images, but it makes sense because these animals aren't, they didn't evolve to have tiny little packets of poison floating around in their ecosystem that look like little pellets of food. Um, so the environmental impact is really devastating. And it's, it's genuinely sort of the last socially acceptable form of litter. Like you would never feel comfortable just sort of like throwing a crisp packet on the ground, the people who do litter crisp packets sort of do it on the sly. But uh, it's by far the most toxic form of waste that most average people will produce. Because like you, you're looking at toxicity similar to something like a battery, the, the amount of toxic chemicals that are in a cigarette butt. And yet people feel comfortable flicking that plastic waste onto the street, into bushes, into the Liffey directly. Um, so that sort of larger environmental problem is definitely what we're hoping to tackle with FilterCycle. We also have Harry with us here, another co-founder of FilterCycle. So was there was there a moment, I suppose, you're, you're all students, I believe, still at Trinity College. And was there a moment for you guys when you realized, OK, this challenge is so big, we have to do something about it? Uh, yeah, thanks again for having us on, Vincent. Um, so back in, uh, two years ago now, two and a half years ago almost, uh, geez, it's been a long time and it doesn't feel like it. Uh, we were, I was living with the other, one of our other co-founders, Mark, um, in our student accommodation and Liam, a friend of Liam's, childhood friend of Liam's had come to him, uh, posed the, you know, the, the idea or the notion of the environmental impact that cigarette butts have on the planet. Um, and so then from there, Liam came to myself and Mark, Mark being, uh, a chem chemistry student, uh, myself being an international business student, and we kind of formed the three um, three parts of the pie, if you will, um, that make up kind of that that made up the company as it was then. Uh, and you know, we realized from from that moment when we actually started to do a bit more digging, just how bad the environmental damage was uh, caused by this litter, um, and also not only that but how little people are doing like liam mentioned earlier uh, to actually solve it so if you you know look up cigarette butt recycling 
you know, you'll find very few, if any, you know, results of actual, um, actual recycling efforts that fully recycle all of the toxic chemicals from, or, sorry, fully remove all the toxic chemicals from the waste um, and then repurpose that material into a reusable plastic like we we're doing. So we were, you know, very stunned at that and kind of thought, like, how could something that's been literally, you know, cigarettes have been around for however many years and, and somebody hasn't realized or come up with some sort of a solution to actually combat that. So once we actually realized that there wasn't a scalable, uh, widespread solution in place, you know, we kind of made that our, 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 our mission and, our, and, has, and it's been driving us ever since, you know, we're very passionate now about as we were before, but even more so actually having done the research and having and having seen the figures, um, you know, we've become much more uh, passionate about the, the, the issue of cigarette litter. Was it a case of once you started thinking about it, you just saw cigarette butts everywhere? It's like, you know, when you go to, to buy a new car and you're thinking about buying a new Volkswagen or whatever it is, apparently, you know, Volkswagens, you see them everywhere after that. Was it a bit like that with cigarette butts for you guys? Exactly, yeah. If you, like you know, replace every cigarette butt that you see on the street with, you know, the image of, I don't know, some small, you know, th piece of poison, you know, and, and once you start doing that, you actually realize that every street around the world, every community, every area, you know, is filled with all of this, you know, genuinely harmful, toxic, poisonous material uh, that, you know, was once just seen as just kind of like, as if you would see a, a stone on the street, but you know, once you actually make that kind of connection and 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 are cognizant of of the damage that 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 it does, then it starts to become way more apparent to you. And then, from a science perspective, you obviously had to get started with different experiments. And I believe the the tools used in the early days were were fairly basic, to say the least. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in the in the very early days, we obviously had no funding, and we were we were operating on a student budget. So for the initial chemical tests, we actually couldn't afford beakers, as in like the jars they use in the chemistry lab. So Mark and Harry went to Little and bought a bunch of pickle jars and brought them home and emptied out the pickles and, and we washed them out. And then that's what we that's what we did our initial chemical tests in. It was actually just little pickle jars. Um, so yeah, the initial the initial tests were fairly uh, on a budget all right. And so what you were effectively trying to do was to somehow extract this plastic from the cigarette butt. So how long did it take to, to get to a stage where it was actually something that was a viable option, I guess? So it, it took a while to develop the process itself. Um, but for us, it, it was also, we didn't fully understand how dangerous the material we were working with was in the beginning, uh, which we're fortunate it took us a while to scale up so that we could actually develop that understanding that this is really toxic waste. If we're going to be handling it, it has to be gloves, goggles, gas masks, PPE, everything. Uh, and gas masks used to be a lot harder to find than they are now. Um, so for me, actually, on the, on the previous question of, like, was there a moment when you realized you had to work on this? It was during the, the second round of our tests. So we recycled about 5,000 cigarette butts and we got a load of, toxic black sludge out of it and like you couldn't look at it directly you couldn't stand near it the stuff was so vile and it, it felt almost like cartoonish like this is what this is what you would draw in a cartoon to represent toxic waste and i was sitting there thinking like this is these these cigarette these were like cigarette butts picked up off the street and this kind of awful toxic waste was inside them uh, and this was a tiny fraction of the amount of the six trillion cigarette butts ending up being thrown away each year. And um, so, yeah, as we as we scaled up, we realized we only really demonstrated that it was viable in our most recent pilot when we recycled 250,000 cigarette butts. Because, you know, it's one thing for the process to work on a lab scale, like in a back garden. It's another thing to go into a production facility and actually put together the machinery and put together the process on a large scale and see it work and actually produce plastic. Uh, so that was that was a relief that it actually did work at the at the larger scale, having put all the, the years of work into it. From an awareness perspective, I think that's what people need to see. I mean, if you could put those types of uh, pictures and videos up on your website or on social media or whatever it is to make people aware of the fact that the, the consequences of smoking is not just the health consequences, that there's this sludge that 
is left in these cigarette butts that trickles into the oceans. That's what we need to see. Um, and then from from a business perspective, you're basically taking your cigarette butts as your input and then you're producing an output in terms of the recycled plastic. So first of all, in terms of the input, how do you gather all those cigarette butts? Uh, yeah, so uh, for our pilot, we had partnered with a number of international organizations, namely World Cleanup Day, uh, BTV, um, and a couple, a couple of other uh, organizations in Europe um, in particular who sent us uh, over a million a million cigarette butts, I believe. Yeah, a million cigarette butts. Um, and uh, so, so that's how we received our our, our cigarette butts for the pilot. Um, and uh, go into the future, you know, that's we, we we aim to work closely with these kind of volunteer groups across the world, who you know want nothing more than to see their streets clean, um, and to actually get rid of this toxic waste. Uh, we're also in the process of setting up um, a network of collection units. Um, it, it domestically in Ireland first, and then with the intention of doing so abroad as well. Um, these units will be, you know, are purpose built for collecting cigarette butts. They're standalone units, um, and yeah. So that once we have a scalable version of that network here in Ireland, um, we can then implement that, you know, abroad once we um, kind of set up similar style recycling facilities in other in other countries, but. You know, as I said, primarily right now, uh, we're working closely with volunteer groups um, and, you know, with county council initiatives right now in, in order to get uh, these units up around the country so that, you know, the more units that they have, uh, that we have around the country and the more people that actually see them on their on the, the end of their street, the more people are going to be educated about the problem um, and the more people are going to be kind of cognizant that, you know, instead of throwing their butt on the street, they might, you know, uh, keeping on them until they see one of these units or even just a, a normal bin, which is better, you know, infinitely times better than discarding it on the street anyway. So um, supply is definitely not an issue. We're, you know, all too aware of the the scale of the problem <clears throat> that is cigarette litter. Um, and, you know, with 6 trillion discarded every year and in, in, in markets like Asia where the smoking rates are higher than they've ever been, uh, even though people think that smoking is slowly dying, it certainly isn't for the majority of the population of the world. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a big enough problem for us to continue to try and tackle. And then in terms of the output, the recycled plastic that you're producing, can you give listeners maybe a sense of what that actually is and what kind of product it's used in? Yeah, so the, the plastic itself is a material called cellulose acetate. Uh, so... At the moment, this plastic would be used in sort of high-end sunglasses frames. So if you have tortoise shell sunglasses or any particular pattern of sunglasses, that's almost certainly made from cellulose acetate. Uh, but it's a, it's a thermoplastic, so it can be molded into essentially any shape. Uh, so any rigid plastic product we see is potentially being uh, something that could be made from filter plastic or plastic. And what percentage of the market would you say in terms of plastic use in these products that is um, they're actually using this recycled material? So recycled plastic at the moment is a relatively small portion of the, the overall plastics market. Uh, I'm not sure what the number is off the top of my head. But as far as the market for our plastic goes, we're really marketing the positive environmental impact it has rather than the material on like a cost basis. So one kilogram of our plastic, based on the figures we have at the moment, uh, takes about 10,000 cigarette butts to recycle. Um, and that can save a maximum of 10 million liters of water from being polluted. Uh, so that's four Olympic swimming pools, which is an enormous amount of water. But it really just goes to show how devastatingly toxic cigarette butts are. Um, so really, when we are talking to brands and manufacturers and we've had expressions of interest from several in our plastic they're they're really purchasing the the positive environmental impact of the plastic as opposed to the material itself because in terms of cost we're not going to compete with you know crude oil and petroleum plastic and the sort of enormous scale of that existing industry it's the fact that you know if you buy one pair of sunglasses made from our plastic you actually save enough water from nicotine and microplastic pollution to fill a swimming pool 
And that's that's the key, really, isn't it? It's about education and awareness for people to understand that if they're buying a product, they may be paying a little bit more, but the environmental impact has been reduced dramatically. And that's that's part of the awareness campaign that needs to happen, I guess, at a at an individual consumer level. I would agree, and I think uh, what's what's also important is you know newer concepts like the circular economy uh, and things like that are being talked about more and more as you know we kind of move into this age of sustainability um and you know green enterprises or sustainable enterprises like ourselves you know it's important for not just the enterprises and the entrepreneurs who are setting up these sort of businesses or who are looking to combat these um these issues but it's more it's also like you said about educating the you know the population and really getting just normal people to realize that instead of purchasing, you know, a bottle of water that's made from virgin plastic, that's, you know, single use, that's going to be thrown away. And even if it's recycled, the costs of recycling, things like that, you know, it doesn't do any, any, any good for our environment. Um, whereas like using plastic, like filter plastic, for example, it's not, you know, we're displacing the need for virgin plastics that would have been used in whatever products that are going to be made with that plastic. So, you know, it's it's really just putting putting those inputs back into the economy and and making you know useful products out of out of that plastic as opposed to uh, further you know reducing the finite resources that we have and 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 you know letting some sort of this sort of toxic uh, toxic litter just just kind of accumulate. There's a lot of talk, obviously, about younger generations being a more socially conscious, more environmentally conscious. You, you guys are still at university. I believe you're finishing up this year. Do you think that more students are talking about sustainability and the issues and, and really taking this stuff seriously? Um, yeah, I mean, it, just in my own experience, I know that uh, the, the majority of people who I speak to who are genuinely interested in what we're doing and who are genuinely uh concerned about the the issues that we're tackling they not all most not all of them but a lot of them tend to be of a younger demographic they tend to be you know our age maybe a little older maybe up to 30 years older uh, and it's not to say that you know the older generations don't care but they were never brought up with that constantly being reminded to them it, they never they were never brought up with the idea of you know the world is going to end unless you do something now you know, whereas now more and more people like our age, my age, um, you know, and younger, they, they've been brought up. I mean, they've been brought up with iPads, but they've also been brought up with, you know, constantly being reminded by their parents, by their peers, by the gov- governments, by the news that, you know, the world is, in a, is, is, is headed down a very dark path unless we make some serious changes now. Um, and, you know, for us, it's more just we want to be able to at least do our part and, and fix this massive issue as fast as we can, you know, before it's too late, you know, and not not to sound kind of uh, like. You don't want to paint a negative picture exa- effectively yeah, exactly effectively of, yeah. of the world. Yeah. But you're aware that that this is a, an issue that, that you want to tackle. And that's I mean, that's a positive thing because I'm, I firmly believe that for sustainable development to happen, that we need more companies like yourselves to actually come about and to be innovative and to think about these challenges and how we can resolve them. And I guess, you know, a lot of people see sustainability as as a constraint. And the other side of it is that it represents an opportunity with various transitions that are going to be happening across various sectors. And, um, you know, this is also a commercial business for you guys. So, you know, from from the early days of the pickle jars, how, how has the company progressed and where are you from a, from a business perspective? So we, we've graduated a little bit from pickle jars. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've just finished running our first industrial pilot of the process. And so we were in two startup accelerators last year, Launchbox with Trinity and the EU's Climate Kick. And that gave us uh, all told 36,000 euro, which we put towards the, the pilot, um, which it's a, it's a chemical recycling process. It was expensive and difficult to, to build the machinery and to get it all set up. And part of our problem was that because we'd invented the recycling process, we couldn't just like buy equipment off the shelf. We had to get it made bespoke and we had to look for quotes and so on, so on. 
And then where we are now, we've had expressions of interest uh, from several companies, uh, notably Amber Eyewear and uh, Cron Eyewear in purchasing our plastic to use in their products. So obviously, because cellulose acetate, the material is already being used in eyewear and sunglasses, it's, a, it's easy for the eyewear industry to pick up our material, but we're not limited to eyewear. We've had expressions of interest from clothing brands and uh, just plastics manufacturers generally. So at the moment where we are, we are looking to raise some more pre-seed funding uh, to finish the design work for our commercial facility, which we hope to start building next year in 2022, and which will hopefully become operational in 2023. And so if we plan to have a capacity to recycle 1.6 million cigarette butts per day, uh, which will let us produce around 40 tons of recycled plastic per year, and we'll have the capacity to recycle around 10% of the cigarette butts generated in Ireland every year. And that would, that would really let us sort of saturate the country with uh, standing ashtrays and collection receptacles and sort of, sort of prove the premise that you can make cigarette butts a commonly recycled material and you can educate people and you can do it profitably. And we've always been of the opinion that it has to be profitable and financially self-sustaining if it's going to scale globally, like you can only guilt people into doing the right thing for so long. Eventually, you actually just have to, you know, fund it properly and solve it as an engineering problem. So that's where we are now. I think that's an important point because when we think of sustainability, a lot of people immediately go to the environment and think about um, the natural resources we have. But for real sustainability to happen there has to be a financial sustainability built into the business as well otherwise it becomes just a charity and i think that we can tackle the sustainability challenges from a business perspective if we have if we approach it with the right mindset i think as well and i suppose there's a certain amount of it as well is that you still require that change in behavior at a consumer level because if if consumers don't change their behavior they'll always go with the lower cost option so there is, it still does keep coming back to that education and awareness point, I think. Yeah, absolutely. We would agree. Um, it's, it's very necessary that consumers who are buying plastic products care about the environmental impact of their purchases in order for our business to exist. Um, and then obviously smokers need to learn that their cigarette butts are not biodegradable. Even if they were biodegradable, they're still soaked in toxic waste. So that wouldn't, it still wouldn't be acceptable to be, you know, just flicking them into nature, but they're not biodegradable. They're made of plastic and they actually in water unravel into around 12,000 little microplastic fibers, each of which is soaked in toxic waste. So it, it's difficult to overstate the environmental damage being done. And it's largely down to the fact that, you know, people aren't aware of the damage they're doing by littering the cigarette butts. And some of them don't care. Um, which is why it's important as well for there to be legislation again um, and fining people for litter and requiring the the cleanup efforts uh, to continue to take place. And then, you know, and during the uh, COVID crisis, has that made it more difficult to be running a startup? For us, it's been sort of a, a mixed blessing. So we were we built essentially a small factory while being in college. And that's not something we could have done if college was in person. And I, I remember a few times I was at the facility watching a machine with one eye and then watching my lectures with the other. Or I remember on another occasion back during the summer, I was pitching for uh, an accelerator that we ended up getting into in the morning. And then I had an exam that afternoon as soon as I got off the call with the accelerator. And sort of it, it's given us a lot of flexibility. And we're fortunate insofar as because cigarette butts are so, so toxic, we were already kitted out in PPE. Like we're already treating our waste as radioactive. So it wasn't a huge increase in effort for us to just be that little bit extra safe um, in terms of COVID transmission. But at the same time, you know, it's difficult to work 10, 12 hour days managing college and the startup when you're also not allowed to go, to, go outside. It does, but that's sort of a universal experience for everyone. Uh, yeah, and I just I'll just add to that. I think as well, uh, especially given kind of the way or the issues that we're trying to tackle and how we're trying to tackle them by educating people 
Um, you know, COVID has given us the opportunity where really unlike any other, where, you know, the majority of people for the majority of their day, uh, they're at home, they're on their laptop, they're on their phone. They're not, you know, whether they're working or they're in school, most of the time they, they, they have a lot more free time. Uh, but what do they spend during that free time? They, they spend it at home. So for us, it, it, you know, it kind of gives us the ability to reach out to more people and I think get more eyes on what we're doing um, and kind of hone in on that message now when everyone is, you know, in one place at home and they're not running around or they, you know, where they, when they otherwise would be, you know, too busy to, to actually pay attention to what we're, to, to our message or what we're trying to uh, achieve, you know, and, it's, and even just on a, on on a business on the business side reaching out to people um you know a lot of companies a lot of businesses the ones that fortunately aren't you know struggling um they're not very busy so it just gives us that kind of extra leg up in terms of you know really getting our feet on the ground and starting and, and starting the business the way we have you know and i don't i'm not sure if we would have had the same amount of growth that we have in the last you know, six months to a year, had it not been for COVID and had it not been for us just having copious amounts of time to be able to devote to what we're doing now. So just on the point as well, it's a lot easier to get meetings with important people now that meetings are on Zoom. Like you can meet with people from around the world and anyone in the country. And it's literally, they'll give you 15 minutes of their time because they know it is exactly 15 minutes and they don't have to go anywhere and you're not going to be loitering around in their building so that's been useful as well no i think that's a good point it has fundamentally changed the way people think about doing business you can now get on a zoom call as you say have a half an hour call or whatever it may be to talk with a potential investment opportunity or or a client or whatever it may be um so just to to, to end the podcast i suppose if if somebody was listening from the investment world or potential clients per se is it the investment side that might be able to be of most assistance to bring you to the next level? Or is it a case of just getting more clients aware of what you do and the solution that you're providing? So we will be raising a seed round uh, starting later this year. So obviously, if anyone is listening who would like to be involved in that, please get in touch. You can go on our website, filtercycle.com. But for us, our priority at the moment is getting more customers for the plastic itself. Uh, because we've always been very clear that we want to operate profitably as a manufacturing company. And that means getting more, <clears throat> getting more brands and manufacturers who can buy into our environmental mission and who are willing to experiment with new materials and be innovative. So if there's anyone listening who is in that space, who either sells or makes products that you think could potentially use our plastic in them and that would benefit from that kind of environmental story behind them uh, definitely get in touch okay great well thanks for coming on the podcast today and um, i would encourage listeners to check out the website filtercycle.com and to learn more about the environmental impact of cigarette butts and to understand what this company is doing because i think if we are going to achieve uh, the holy grail as i say of uh, sustainable economic development we will need more sustainability startups like filter cycle innovating and coming up with new solutions so thanks for your time today guys thank you very much for having us cheers for taking the time to listen to the esg factor podcast if you're interested in a more sustainable future then check out the ESGFactor.com for details on our Patreon community and how you can support the making of more content like this. I'm Vincent and I'll catch you later.